Good morning. This is Bill from Auto House of Naples on a muggy, miserable Florida Tuesday. The good news is it is September, so we are getting there. We're getting to the point where the weather might start cooling down. In fact, I can tell the days are getting a little bit shorter, uh, which means eventually the cool weather might be coming. But uh, I am under no illusions that it's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, back in Peter's yard, I can hear the birds. I can't see any, thank God. Uh, none swooping down quite yet. Keeping an eye out, though. You never know. Uh, my apologies for being so long away. Uh, you know, this is, what, God, it's been weeks since I've done a video. Uh, it's been very, very busy, as, uh, you know, one finds it. Uh, I did an auction up in North Carolina a couple weekends ago. Then I did the Mecham auction, which was a complete waste of time last weekend. And uh, here I am today hawking my tawdry wares. But, um... Uh, yeah, what can I tell you? It's just been one of those one of those things. Obviously, I've run into problems. Andrew has not yet been able to change the name of the site, so that just goes on and on in a miserable, endless thing that may or may not eventually get settled. And uh, anyway, nobody cares about all of that. Uh, the state of the world is still pretty stupid, uh, I have to say. It's just getting worse and worse. Every time I turn on the news, I watch it for like five minutes, get disgusted, and then turn it off. Uh, talk about petty idiocy. I mean, we are living in idiocracy right now. We really, really are. It's a complete lack of education. I mean, not that I'm any kind of Eton graduate or anything, you know, on to Oxford, but uh, I mean, for the love of God, people have absolutely no, young people seem to have no true concept of history, of where they came from, of what got us here, and uh, the way things are going today. I actually see people calling for communism now. Communism! They're, I mean, they're not kidding. And I wonder to myself, what kind of jobs do these people think they're going to have under communism? Do they not understand that even in communism, there are people who have to empty the portable toilets? And frankly, it'll probably be them. But honey, I've been warned to not get too political in these things. I'm not even going to talk about all the masks and COVID stuff and CDC announcements. and uh, But I can tell you this, you know, for the whole Mecham auction, uh, they were very, very particular about making people wear masks. So I did. And it was hateful. It was abs... I mean, I didn't look, I'm not one of these anti-maskers who's going to go on a tirade or a crusade. I, you know, if you make it so I have to do it, I'll do it. Uh, but I'm not going to lie. I'm going to tell you that I absolutely hate it. It feels gross breathing in all my old foul... Uh, you know, old tacos that I ate and cigarettes and uh, it's just, oh God. I mean, if I could go back and, you know, make myself be born 40 years earlier, I probably would. <sighs> anyway, nobody cares about all that. So let's just get into this. This is a 1988 Lincoln town car. Uh, believe it or not, this was the first Lincoln town car, or at least the first town car that actually was badged and named a town car as a model. Lincoln had been using the town car for many, many years as a uh, trim platform on the Continental or other cars. Uh, town car refers to, uh, back in the very olden days, it was where you'd have this closed-in box in the rear where the rich fat cat sat giggling and smoking cigars and, you know, molesting chambermaids while the chauffeur was up front in an open-air environment, uh, chewing bugs with his teeth, letting the rain in, uh, hating the person in the back seat. And I suppose that's part of what led to our lust for communism today, but God help everyone. Everybody. Uh, but anyway, so that was essentially a town car. And then, there, you know, Cadillac had the Sedan de Ville, which was a fancy French way of saying town car. And the two of them just competed for a long, long time. Uh, but to go back, you have to start in the beginning of Lincoln. And here's something a little bit fascinating, is that Lincoln and Cadillac were founded by the same guy. Uh, a guy named William Leland, uh, one of these very odd, progressive engineering types, born in Vermont in 1843, somewhere around there. There's some argument as to what town he came from, but I mean, who the hell cares? Uh, but anyway, he was one of these guys who was just absolutely dead set to do something, and he went on to do things. He was uh, the youngest of eight children. Uh, he got into engineering. He worked for the firearms companies, including Colt, and uh, that's where he got in love for this new uh, zeitgeist going on at the time, which was interchangeability. And that was 
you know, believe it or not, even though it's something we take for granted now, uh, it was quite a sea change at the time. And what that meant was you could take one model of something, you could take a part off it, and you could stick it on the same model of something else without any kind of uh, filing or engineering or change, you know, because the, the parts were all designed to exactly the same standard. And that is something that really was only coming into its own at the end of the 19th century. So, uh, very interesting guy, Leland. He was called in as a professional engineer uh, to aid in the liquidation of the second effort of Henry Ford, the Henry Ford Motor Company. Uh, of course, Henry, being a famous bastard, had a huge fight with his uh, comrades. The, the comrades decided they would band together, go against Henry, and liquidate the company. Uh, they called in Leland to oversee it. Uh, Leland took a look around and told the guys, you're crazy if you liquidate this thing. We can start making cars. I've been making engines for this guy named Olds, uh, went on to be Oldsmobile. We can use that and create a new company, which the investors did. And they created a new company named Cadillac, and they you know, sent Henry Ford down the pipeline, uh, which really pissed off Henry Ford, which frankly is not a guy you want to piss off, at least not uh, in the future. And uh, Leland went to work running Cadillac, and in fact, the uh, first Cadillac model uh, was virtually identical, with the exception of the engine, to the first uh, Ford Model A. Not the famous Model A, but the first Model A, kind of a runabout thing uh, that Henry Ford came out with a couple of years later. And uh, anyway, in 1909, uh, Leland sold out to General Motors, Durant. Uh, you know, it ran the company then until 1917 when he and Durant got in a big fight over supplying Liberty engines for airplanes in World War I. Apparently Durant was a bit of a pacifist and wanted absolutely no part in the war. <clears throat> Whereas, uh, what's his face, uh, Leland decided that he did, whether it was for ideological reasons or profit reasons, he wanted to build airplane engines. So they parted ways. Uh, Leland started his own company to build these airplane engines. And after the war, that went on to be called Lincoln, uh, a company he named after the president uh, that he said was the first president he had voted for. Uh, so there it is. A guy named Leland developed both Lincoln and Cadillac. Uh, that's a tough one for some of these fighters to swallow. There's a big fight between these two companies. Uh, but anyway, Leland did quite well with Lincoln for a few years. And then in 1922, it all went bust. He just wasn't doing that well. Enter the Ford Motor Company. <laughs> and Mr. Ford gets his revenge. I mean, uh, apparently the uh, court people said that the company had a very healthy $16 million worth of assets. So uh, Ford offered $5 million for it as kind of a finger in the face to, uh, to Mr. Leland. The court upped it to $8 million, which then they paid. Uh, but it really did uh, obviously please Mr. Ford to have uh, Mr. Leland under his thumb. And Leland thought he was going to run Lincoln the way he saw fit for the next few years, but did not happen. Uh, enter Edsel Ford as the sort of managing partner of Lincoln, and eventually he just drove Leland and his kid William out of it. Uh, they left in shame in, I don't know, 1925 uh, or something. They had to, to bail. And uh, Lincoln became Ford's only, truly only luxury brand for many years. Uh, you know, eventually Ford did buy Jaguar, Aston Martin, Volvo, all that stuff. But uh, then they got rid of it again a few years later. And Lincoln today is still Ford's only luxury brand. So uh, many, many years of interesting stuff with Lincoln that uh, now is well over 100 years old. Uh, they did build some pretty incredible cars going on through the years, very exclusive cars. Uh, they became, you know, a maker of 12 cylinders. Then they got rid of their eight, so they were exclusively 12 cylinders for a while. They were competing with Packard, Cadillac, Pierce Arrow, uh, even Duesenberg, and, uh, you know, creating some pretty neat stuff. But uh, post-war, you know, after building a bunch of bombers for the uh, war effort, uh, they got into more of a, you know, less coach built more of a mass-produced thing that would make them profitable. There's the phone, of course. 
Oh, boy, and that continued on and on. Uh, Continental was its own brand for many years until it got merged with Lincoln. Uh, Mercury was merged, uh, merged with Lincoln pretty early on. And uh, it just led to some very confusing and strange uh, hybrid cars over the years. If you remember the Lincoln Versailles, that was in the late 70s. It was considered one of the most egregious attempts at badge engineering ever, uh, where they took a... Um, uh, basically a Ford Granada and then a Mercury something or another and turned it into a Lincoln and uh, enter the early 80s Lincoln is marketing like six different cars that all look identical so all of that had to change enter the town car one of the first cars based on the Ford Panther platform uh, which became one of their most successful platforms ran all the way through 2011 mind you and uh, was a very very successful thing for Ford uh, but anyway after all of that uh, diatribe this is it this is the first generation true Lincoln town car and remains one of the most successful in history and what's interesting about it is it wasn't really meant to be uh, if you remember in the 80s gas prices were all over the place the economy was weird Lincoln thought it would build this thing which was considered a downsized town car but still full frame uh, for a couple of years before going over to front drive stuff if you remember the late 80s that continental actually the mid 80s uh, that front drive uh, Taurus based Continental came out and that was supposed to kind of be the future of Lincoln but instead when Cadillac went front drive tons of their customers went over to the town car uh, because it was still rear drive full frame gas prices stabilized and uh, Lincoln had a lot of success with this car so they just kept it the way it was all the way through 1989 uh, then in 90 they came out with another generation of town car a little bit more aero looking based on this platform and uh, then finally in 97 the third and final generation of town car came out uh, but this was the first one and to me it is the most handsome and the most the, if you will the last of the true American Luxo barges that just didn't take into account any of the European crap going on at the time I mean there's no attempt at aerodynamicizing this car uh, there is zero attempt at making it handle uh, this was a big full-frame Luxo barge meant to pamper its occupants you know navigate itself down the highway at, uh, at decent speeds while providing an incredible uh, amount of touch-free comfort for everyone in it. And uh, I love it. I love the big grill in the front, the quad headlamps, the big chrome bumpers, the forward-looking fenders with the clear uh, parking lamps at the front, the, uh, the hood badge on the top. It is just a very, very attractive car. Uh, what is arguably the most attractive fake wire wheel ever made, uh, you know, to the point that people think they are wire wheels, including the auctioneer who sold me this car called it wire wheels. Well, it's not. They're faux. They're not real wires, but they do a great job of looking like it. And, uh, you know, the chrome on the bottom, uh, absolutely gorgeous. You see that big, this is one of my favorite features of this car. You see that big light on the side right behind the parking lamp, that big corner lamp when you turn on the signal uh, that just lights up the whole side either side of the car and uh, makes it uh, easy to navigate this thing around corners uh, this one had the uh, rather expensive carriage roof option this is the kind of stuff that just doesn't happen anymore uh, you see how it's kind of cunningly designed to look like a convertible so we used to say in the 80s if you think it's ugly now wait till you see it with the top down uh, but it was quite an expensive option I want to say like 1500 bucks back when the whole car cost you know barely Early 20 grand. Uh, it did get rid of that little quarter window. Uh, but did give it a rather handsome, nice big fabric roof. Uh, this one also had a very special option, the uh, towing package, which uh, was popular at the time. Uh, what that did was gave it a true dual exhaust from front to back and a 355 limited slip rear diff. So nice option to have in this car. Uh, in 86, it went through a refresh. They did make the car a little bit more aerodynamic. They changed the tail treatment a little bit, uh, smoothed out the trunk, smoothed out the fender and uh, I think it's probably the best looking incarnation of the car uh, anyway let's just start inside go inside the trunk I love this clink so you lift this cover up it'll rest itself then you use one of the two keys you're given stick it in here <clears throat> 
twist and up it comes. So obviously an enormous trunk uh, designed to fit whatever you might need to put inside. Of course, a lot of these cars were used for livery, you know, like uh, limousines and such. So they had to have pretty big trunks. As you can see, I've got all my crap in here. There's just no way around that. I had to bring a special extra amount of crap today. Uh, anyway, you see a full-size spare tire place inside for, you know, we're not going to go into the old mafia jokes, but, you know, you definitely could fit a few deceased guys in here. Uh, whoever owned this thing put in a modern radio, which really offends me beyond description. Really, really does. But uh, the good news is they left the original factory radio there, which uh, I am going to have reinstalled today because I just can't take it. So uh, if you want to put back in that Bluetooth thing because you want CDs and Bluetooth audio, that's fine. But yeah, that's it for me. I can't do it. So anyway, that's going back in today. Uh, but anyway, everything nice and lovely there. Uh, you saw this little thing kind of motor itself up when we opened the uh, uh, the trunk. That is a soft close mechanism. So when I lower it, it'll suck itself down. And there it is. Nice stuff. Have a look under the hood. This was such an unabashed, unapologetic American luxury car. It's really why I love it. So under here was another useful thing for Ford. Uh, instead of dicking around with different engines, they got rid of the big blocks. They, in fact, the fuel mileage went up 40% in one year model alone. Uh, and then uh, the uh, old carbureted um, five liter 302 became this frying pan uh, sideways mounted uh, tuned runner uh, 302 with and I, the horsepower is kind of shitty like uh, maybe 160 with this dual exhaust option but it still motivates the car down the road fine uh, but this was used cross-platform you would find this engine in the mark 7 which was mustang based you'd find it in the pickup trucks and uh, of course that's part of what made ford uh, become very very profitable as time went on so pretty good stuff there uh, but anyway terrific engine uh, this uh, frying pan five liter that they put in these cars and uh, good for hundreds of thousands of miles and this one's in great shape very very nice stuff love it and I just love that big V in the hood with oh god is that cool and the little bumperettes white walls uh, stuff like this this uh, keyhole is illuminated so is this keypad this was the first car Lincoln brought the keypad out in uh, you could uh, open close the car or open the trunk by putting in a code uh, all very neat stuff uh, the rear seats incredibly comfortable your Canadians are going to be intensely chipper back there uh, look at this we got dust we got the detail I'm just I'm cursed with never having great detailing uh, but anyway it's just all this American luxury you know the faux wood the uh, little pop-up you know ashtray stuff it's got the light in the window the pull handle um, yeah, this deep plush carpeting that your fingers sink into uh, it's just a lovely way to live and we've lost it and I miss it and I wish we had it back uh, in the back you've got these little pockets nice place to stuff a revolver if you're getting carried around back there and worried about things uh, you got a little center armrest you've got a package shelf back there and uh, anyway all very lovely stuff key out. I do love the mirror mounted thermometer. You can see where it sucks the air in the front. It's also illuminated which I did notice worked this morning and then has this cool uh, dial style thermometer with the Lincoln logo on it uh, that lets you know what temperature it is outside when you're really cool and cold inside. Uh, more uh, uh, controls here with the windows, the window lock, the door lock, the power mirrors, the power seats. I like having the control uh, on the armrest instead of the seat itself does have a manual recline. Love the pillow leather that's super comfortable. I mean, you can see why people went over to these things, especially the Cadillac guys. Front drive. The hell? But anyway, so uh, Lincoln ended up selling a bunch of these cars because they were so damn comfortable. All right, to start it, you just put the key in like so with the square head. Different key for 
uh, for the trunk and for the uh, ignition and doors, which is kind of neat. You see that fluorescent display comes to life, all very lovely. Uh, that was quite modern when I was a kid and still looks pretty modern to me today. Uh, you know, again, I'm a product of my times. Uh, did have this great trip computer here on the right side of the panel uh, with all of these uh, buttons. Of course, this was an optional readout, but you could get into your fuel economy. Look at 15.8 average miles per gallon. Nobody's been beaten on this thing. Uh, you could do elapsed miles, you could do elapsed time, uh, average speed, two miles an hour. That sounds about right for the fast lane. Uh, destination, we're 32 miles past destination. It's kind of an early, um, what would you call it, navigation of sorts. Uh, ETA, you can put in, uh, you know, so you get, yeah, if you think you're two and a half hours, you'll know how close you are to your trip. It's all very cool stuff. Uh, again, this horrible pioneer they put in uh, with Bluetooth. God, that just offends me. Uh, very flat dash uh, with the wood paneling. Looks nice, looks American luxury, looks proper. Lincoln Town Car badging on it. Uh, this very cool self-dimming mirror, which when I was driving over here, I can tell you works extraordinarily well. Uh, this will set the distance that it will pick up the dimming and you can turn it off or leave it on auto. Uh, nice big American style sun visors with uh, cocaine mirrors and them all very lovely. Uh, one thing I always found fascinating about Lincoln was where they hinged the tilt wheel. Instead of it being the whole column, it just tilted right at the very end, uh, which actually works just fine, better than I would have thought. Um, in fact, they used to have horn buttons on the column, but they moved it later on in production to there, and you see it has a nice big train horn. Uh, but anyway, your wipers on all these incredibly cool chrome stocks, your big uh, shift mechanism there, I don't know. This is just great American luxury to me. I absolutely love it. All right, let's go for a spin. All right, so I love looking down the front of this thing with this giant long hood. And again, this was a downsized car in its day. This was smaller than what people had had before it, but God damn, is it huge today. Uh, you see the big uh, hood ornament on the end, the way it sort of all angles up. And this is not a car that you steer. Uh, this is a car that you navigate the way you would like a Carver yacht or an ocean yacht or something. Uh, in fact, the uh, the hood uh, 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 the hood ornament becomes a very very important part of how you drive the car because you kind of aim that like a target at a point in the distance and then sort of correct the car towards that point instead of really steering it. Uh, it's much more of a nautical affair to drive this thing. Uh, it's got again this giant. Well, we're have incredible sun here. I cleaned the window myself this morning. Look at that. So it's not all insane and ridiculous the way it is uh, when the uh, the detailer does it. But anyway, there's the uh, sun visor. So you just kind of navigate this car and make corrections as you go, like you would in a large boat. You're floating on the pavement. I mean, absolutely floating. Uh, you've got this giant full frame. You've got a solid rear axle. We've got squirrels playing with their life. Yeah, you better run. And um, and it becomes one of the most comfortable, incredible experiences you can imagine. Now, if you're one of these guys who you have to feel like you're in a sports car, this is not the car for you. I mean, this is a highway cruiser. That's what this car is all about. Or, you know, a, a town car. You know, you hop in, dressed up for the opera. Uh, you go down, you leave the window up at the stoplight where the homeless guy has the cardboard sign. And uh, then you uh, drive there, watch Puccini or whatever you're going to see. Uh, you know, get back in the town car at the end. In fact, that was one of their commercials at the time. The Lincoln Town Car, please. And it was meant to distinguish how different it looked from all the front drive Oldsmobile and Cadillac badge engineering stuff of the time, even though the brome was out, but uh, Lincoln was smart. Uh, but anyway, that's what this thing is all about. It is true American luxury in the, the class of the greatest generation sense. You know, the people who loved these cars in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. That's who this car was built for. Uh, not the, uh, you know, little baby boomer upstarts who started to want uh, things to be more European and handily and, and uh, road tidy and all that. That was just not the, uh, the function of this thing. Uh, let's see if I can hammer it out of here. Uh, there's 
big dual exhaust singing. And the uh, installation is terrific. You really just get a vibe that there's, you know, this thing again was meant to compete with Mercedes. It was meant to compete with BMW or at least the 7 Series. You know what? That's not true. I'm full of shit. Because the BMW wasn't really considered a luxury brand uh, in 88. It was much more sports oriented. But, uh, you know, the 380 SL, the 560 SEL, this was kind of a cheaper alternative to those cars and um, and really did uh, hold its own in its own way. Uh, obviously, it would compete with Cadillac, Jaguar, with other, uh, you know, high-end luxury makers at the time. And, uh, of course, became incredibly invaluable to the livery services because they went a long time, they didn't require a lot of maintenance, and people just loved driving in them. The zero effort power steering, lovely little thin leather wrapped wheel. Uh, it really becomes a joy to pilot this car around. It really does. I mean, not in a sports car way, but in a luxury car way. Absolutely love it. So there it is. This is a 1988 Lincoln Town Car. Uh, this one has just 38,000 miles on it. Very well-kept, collectible, and level example. If you want to put one away, this is a great choice. Uh, beautiful silver in color, blue carriage roof, navy blue leather. It's got the wire, faux wire upgrade, the carriage roof upgrade, the dual exhaust, and limited slip option. Uh, this is a very, very nice one to have. Uh, if you're interested, call the guys at Auto House 239-263-8500 on the web at autohousenaples.com. Uh, thank you again for having a look. I really appreciate it. I'm going to be back, uh, you know, doing videos this week. We do have a race in Sebring at the end of the week. That's going to throw a curve into thing for Fridays. But uh, anyway, I'll probably be back then the following Tuesday, and we'll just keep getting them up. I bought about 12, 15 cars on that trip, so a lot of cars to get ready and list and video, and they'll all be coming up soon. So anyway, there it is. Thanks for having a look, and we will see you with the next one. Take care.